It begins with our mission and values, a culture of innovation and collaboration, achieving a global perspective beyond the classroom, turning education and theory into practice, developing lifelong interests and connections, and striving to make a difference in our communities. Marist College. Welcome one, welcome all everybody to the third week of EGFC. My name is Keela Miles, joined as always by Soy. And today we are opening it up with a match between two regular old red colleges, Fairfield University taking on Marist College. Yeah, this should be a fun one, a classic Mac battle and kind of a developing rivalry between these two schools uh, throughout the EGF, just across all of our platforms, but here, in uh, SSBU, it's been one-sided as of late, as Marist, they look hot coming into this game. Yeah, Marist soaring above and beyond, but, well, Three, if anyone's gonna two, get them, it could one, be this, go. like you said, developing rival. But Marist just has so much roster depth. We'll see what they choose to utilize as, I'm not sure we've seen this uh, DDB player before. Uh, I think that's from Fairfield, meanwhile, Seen it? That's gonna be one of Coldface's alts, actually. Coldface, many, many hats they wear. Yeah, we've seen Coldface the past two weeks kind of switch up the, between a few characters, but the Lucina is new and off to a great start with that forward smash. Oh yeah, DDD straight on out of there. And even though they do get one hit, they're almost gonna be punished for that forward smash, but not quite. Coldface actually dropping that just a bit. And I like that weight right there, but just drifting in to try and punish DDD's quote end lag. That's how you get yourself punished, but gonna get hit by the Gordo there. And now we see charging at ledge, but the disjoint is gonna let him punish it. Yeah, and a, a bit of a risky move there. And oh no, he misspaced his up B and he gets pineappled for it. That's a tragic way to lose that second stock. Yeah, now without that DDD stock on there, this is very doable. Got DDD off stage, not a ton of options off ledge. You just keep smacking him one time after another. Not challenging the up B super armor, but you get a tech chase situation. Now cold face, gonna be caught by the forward tilt under the platform, but Gonna hold on to that stock, are they? Oh, I actually like that. Yeah, that was a fantastic mix up on the recovery using the neutral B to push yourself closer to that ledge. And Coldface is doing a fantastic job of just holding on to this stock right now. At 150 against a heavy, you might think he's working on borrowed time, but right now he's finding a way to survive. That's a trade and that's gonna go in his favor. That's a three stock to start the day. Yeah, three points on the board for Marist College. The best start you could ask for is... Whew. I... I feel like there were definitely some shenanigans there on occasion. Specifically with those very highly charged attacks again and again and again. So I think we're going to see people start to catch on to those eventually. But overall, just nice clean play from Coldface. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, the other thing I liked too was that... Gordo is such a huge part of King DDD's kit, and Coldface had an immediate way to try and deal with it. Now, it didn't work off the off the start. He got hit by one or two Gordos, but he said, okay, if I just charge this neutral B and time the bounce right, I can use that extra length to knock it back at him. And you saw there, right at the end, it was able to clean up that last stock for him. And it also just threatens a hitbox right there as well. You never really know how they're going to be angling it. It's tough to challenge off stage like that. So overall, not a bad mix up option. I mean, DDD definitely does have some disjoints to challenge that, but either way, I, I feel like that neutral B in particular is deceptively large. 
Yeah, no, I, I agree. And I also like his use of it offstage, like he commented. And, and I think, you know, we don't see a lot of Lucina or Marth here in uh, the EGF, but the one, the people that play the sword characters don't typically use that neutral B all that often. So to see him utilize it a little bit more and in creative ways is, is very fun to watch. Oh, yeah. As the other thing that I noticed, we're talking about one charge attack. We should talk about the other the rocket hammer at ledge it kept it getting punished by the down air but with just one jump could help you out there but instead they're gonna switch characters all together over to the bowser jr Ooh, and, and billy right here and yeah and, and going to fd on top of it too i actually like this counter pick by uh by a casual because now you have those projectiles to work with it's a lot harder for lucina to get in but Coalface seemingly, seemingly not having any trouble with it. Yeah, Lucina, oof, is going to be caught by that wand just a tiny bit. But the disjoints do wreak havoc on Bowser Jr. They really do. He's got burst options, sure, but to put a hitbox in the way, they're not quite as powerful. Oof, going to be caught by that conversion, then. On ledge, not going to be caught, but they're going to parry the wand this time, setting up into the forward smash, but a little too high percent for that to convert. And I like the idea there from a casual too. After the whip forward smash, he went to punish a roll, but he just did it too early in the forward till ended up missing. And that is too many up bees, and the back air will catch cold face. Or sorry, a casual. Ooh, just barely able to get back to ledge. I'm not even sure the up knew how to save them there, but either way, the forward throw will finish them off. A quick sucker punch. Now just using the clown car to get back to center stage. Gonna get caught by the up tilt though, and that's an invitation for some follow-ups. The cold face drops it a little bit, and it's even. Ooh, great catch on the uh, Mecha Koopa, I believe it is. It's called uh, as it spawns, and he got a little bit of a follow-up off of it too. So cold face just doing a great job reacting. Ooh, and I like that the preemptive forward tilt right here to say, "Nah, I'm not dealing with that one this time." You got Bowser Jr. on ledge, and the roller is gonna be caught with just a fade back forward air. That's all you need. Nice, simple tool. And the dash back forward smash, too. Let him whip, get the punish. That's what Coldface is doing. Yeah, now a, a casual is in a huge hole here, down a stock and a half, it feels like, and plenty of work to do here as Coldface, the fact that he was able to survive so long on that first set really puts the pressure on a casual to make a play here. Yeah, the one ledge. They're going to be able to get the reversal off of only one hit of that Nair, and they love to drop that off stage, but it's starting to get reactable, especially when you always land with the wand. Coldface now on ledge, slowly taking that center stage, but we're going to be caught by the forward air, that little disjoint, trying to mix up the recovery again, but now you have the opportunity to whiff against that, though. Coldface playing with maybe a little too much respect. <laughs> yeah, and... Ooh, that neutral B, yeah, that should kill. I don't think a casual is quite ready to DI that properly and ends up biting the dust for it. So, Coldface, huge performance from him to start off the day. Are you kidding me, Coldface? <laughs> Are you kidding me? I, I call you out for having too much respect for your opponent, and what do you do? You do the classic true combo, the true setup, bread and butter. Shield breaker into shield breaker to get the kill <laughs> at, at below kill percent. You know, sure, why not? But hey, that's exactly what you needed to be doing. Maybe with that, not that move in particular, but just systematically using Lucina's speed and in terms of ground speed, air speed, and move speed to just take away the space because Bowser Jr. can't contest the sword. Like, you need to have a hard read to get through. Yeah, no, absolutely. And and you saw it time and time again, too. And, and the other thing, too, was the the repeated use of, of uh, certain options from a casual, right? How many times did he try and land with the wand, you know, and, and Coldface, just as that match went on, started to catch on more and more, caught the back air off that first stock, you know, later on was starting to punish. It was just, it felt like Coldface, excuse me, Coldface was in control of that match really from start to finish. Yeah. And there was some mileage definitely gained by A Casual at times, but it was never really long term. And it felt like they had a bunch of good options, but only one for every scenario. Like when you're landing from up B, you always do the landing wand. When you 
uh, have them at ledge, you drop the bomb down. And those are good options for sure. I've seen them get a lot of mileage in many scenarios, but if they're your only choice, then well, it's not really any mix up. Uh, it felt like, uh, it felt like Coldface just solved the puzzle, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we even saw him parry the, the wand once, and I believe he got a, a follow up off of that. So it it's, you know, we're at the level where if you repeat a certain option numerous times, players are going to catch on. And Coldface has shown now for three weeks straight, he's going to catch on to a lot of these options. Yeah, and now Fairfield, well, that's your opening stuff right out. I know Fairfield had said that they have actually a lot of new players on their roster, a lot of very promising freshmen, which is always a good thing. But it takes time to train up that new talent. So maybe just maybe they maybe they got some more stuff up their sleeve. Uh, these freshmen can be nasty, that I know. But we'll have to see, as there's already quite the deficit. Seven points on the board. That hurts. One away from the maximum amount of points you can earn in a set, right? So, uh, but this goes back to the point of Maris has looked, you know, on fire this season, right? Two and zero, oh, they are outscoring opponents fifty-five to nothing through two weeks. They haven't dropped a single game coming into this week. Now Fairfield, they're one and one. But uh, I believe, yeah, coming in next is Jerry for Fairfield. And he has been money for the Stags. He has been uh, perfect so far, 2-0 and oh in terms of set record. So Fairfield trying to get back on the board here and early. Yeah, and Jerry was one of the players that they called out to me as a generalist. Uh, wearing many hats, a lot of different characters up their sleeves to the point where they did not actually tell me what any of those characters were. They just told me that they have at least six or seven. So we'll see what Jerry's running out uh, up against first as they're up against this Greninja. It's gonna be the Terry. That's an interesting one. Yeah, we saw the Terry, I believe, last week and it looked very good, but this is Rograt uh, on the uh, Greninja for Maris, and Rograt is one of those experienced veterans of this roster, so this should be a very fun matchup. I like that option coverage, though, with the up B. Bit of a frame trap. N uh, not quite true, but off of that Nair, but that drag down into the jab lock. <laughs> Spicy right there. Not quite getting the push away with the up B that you would have wanted, but either way, Rograt is going to hold the stage advantage and not get caught by that very aggressive read. And there's the classic jab jab power dunk combo for a lot of percent and now this is where things get really scary for both of these players but that's a good early up b can't quite snag him before he grabs a ledge early up b into late up b and now you get caught by that jab pressure now you got to deal with go gonna spot dodge that and that's an instant 59 percent this could snowball really fast yeah Rograt is in a lot of danger here. He's got to find a way to take the stock and quickly, but Jerry's playing so smart, just playing a little bit more defensive and just kind of waiting for the options of Rograt. Oh, and that run into the shield right there. That was nice. That's saying, I know what you're doing. And if Jerry catches on to that, how they've conditioned them, yeah, there could be issues. As right now, Jerry is slowly but surely edging out of any kill confirm ranges that Rograt might have. So just do the side B, cross up, Avoid the grab, and now you have even stocks, but you're so close to dying, and Terry off a of one jab can get that easily. That was a huge cross-up on the side delight, but like you said, Rogra has to play so careful now, as Greninja is kind of on the lighter side of the cast. He's done a good job of getting Jerry up to 72%, though. That was an ambitious upbeat. This is a huge opening for Rograt. Yeah, just like that, Rograt has made this almost even. Jerry, not going to get caught by the dash attack, but I happen to re-grab the ledge, but Rograt was not in position to really punish that. Ooh, the long down air right there, just stack on a little more percent, but doesn't spike unless it's the very early hitbox. Going to shield this water shuriken and get the counter as well, but the up in invulnerability will actually save Jerry. That was so smart of him to up be off of that counter, and now he's got go, so this is just back and forth at kill percentage. Dropped Ooh. his shield a little too late, and Rograt takes the stock. 
Yeah, when you, when you have half shield like that and you see a fully charged smash attack right in front of you, even if you know it's not going to break shield, there's still that little part of you that's like, you've got to do something, you've got to do something. And that is what Rograp preyed on. Jerry now, is it okay to play the slow game as we've seen? Just wait for their one opening. As they hold this center stage. They're able to get just a little bit of chip damage, but that's all. Ooh, I like that. The first Nair, and then just waited for Rograt afterward. Didn't try and follow up with anything immediately, but those jabs are going to push Jerry off stage, and now he's in trouble. Yeah, as... Just little, little conversions right now from Jerry is what I'm seeing. Rograt is, I mean, using Greninja's amazing ground game into the drag down jab lock again. Not the jump snipe, but that time it is. Going straight through that side B to get the stock. Jerry, one of the shining stars of Failfield, has dropped their first game against Rograt. Yeah, and that's a huge, you know, uh, boost for Rograt, too, because that was very close and very dangerous. He had to battle back there after losing his first stock. And really, I, I got to commend him the way he played for, you know, kind of playing for your stock, right? That second stock, he had to play so carefully. He was up to, like, I want to say 70 percent ish uh, very quickly because of go and to battle back through that and take both stocks afterward is a is a huge compliment to his skill yeah and ragra is a very unconventional greninja player from what i've seen to be honest i mean usually you see them running around fishing with that amazing down tilt sometimes dash attack if they're getting a little ambitious but down tilt is the name of the game. I don't think I saw it once from Rograt, though. Instead, it was a lot of chip damage with the water shurikens making you antsy and really good strings. Uh, it, I don't think they did a lot of true combos, but that didn't really matter because when you have them in the air and you make them pick an option, you're able to punish it hard with options like side B, and that's what Rograt relied on. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, how many times? I At least twice, right? We saw that uh, drag down up air combo into uh into the jab lock so just fantastic stuff to him now jerry did a really good job early on in that game of just doing basically the same thing getting a little bit of chip damage playing it a little bit slower and seeing what he could get out of it but at the end of the day he's got to find a way to take that second stock off the board and kazuya being counterpicked here so a little bit different but similar style i think kazuya nishima what is there to say, except that he is being currently juggled. Not the greatest air options right now, and just fishing for this 10 hit combo at low percent. It's a nice opening, but they're not quite able to follow the DI, so Rograt slips right out, but they're gonna miss the jab lock, resetting the situation. You gotta play very careful here. And again, these drag downs have done Ooh. so much work for Rograt. He's doing a fantastic job of catching Jerry in the air. Yeah, and not really teching any of these either. Uh, you'd think you'd catch on by this point, but it is a pretty fast first option, and it's not exactly what you expect. Is That's a really good nair right there, spacing it perfectly on shield just to run away. And did you see that? That crouch, I think that was them still trying to SDI. Some really nice stuff to get out of that combo. Yeah, that was... Uh, I, I was confused at first. I was like, why is he kind of crouching? And then I realized, oh yeah, that's... That's what you ha kind of have to do to get out of there. Oh, that was very dangerous, but Jerry's going to be able to get away that down there pausing. But that side B Ooh. is able to take the first stock for Rograt. Yeah, the roll away right there. That was your doom. And now with Rograt having a full stock lead, they don't really feel the need to approach quite as much, I say, as they're right on top of Jerry's shield. But Greninja is usually pretty safe right there until you get caught by the side B. The crumple is a guaranteed fate. Now things back to even, and Jerry's got to find a way to take the lead here and get Fairfield on the board, but it's just been so difficult here. It could be an opening, but no, can't find the follow-up. Yeah, not quite at all. Is The Nair is actually going to stop the up smash. All right, and now you got Jerry off stage going all the way out with that side B. No restraint at all from Rugrat. Yeah, that's a huge side B, and we haven't really seen him go for one of those in the air. And it just feels like right now, Jerry, that chip damage that he was finding in game number one, it's not happening here because Rograt's just so fast, he can't quite catch him. I love these fog fox trots back and forth, just waiting for the opportunity to use the burst option, crossing them up as they land. As 
They're gonna avoid the simple combos, but look at this. Jerry isn't fishing for any of the electric wind god fists that we saw earlier. Instead, it's just playing pure neutral. And well, that's great and all, but you need that touch of death right here. Because when you're down a stock, you need to explode. Ooh, another great drag down. Couldn't quite get the follow up, but look, he's able to dash away as Jerry kind of gets caught swinging for the fences. And these follow ups from Rograt, not quite there. This is dangerous. Harry right there, that is going to be the stock. One stock against Kazuya, this is very doable. But we've seen Rograt loves these. Ooh. They're actually getting juggled around. Able to dash right around behind them though. I thought that was it for sure. But the ground movement right there, able to land back on safe footing. Is it what is going to net Rograt the win is Airfield for now. Or Mayor rather remains undefeated that was I, I feel like jerry just kind of got caught swinging for the fences he wanted the home run off of that last combo i believe it was forward smash right at the end and Rograt was able to i believe air dodge out of it at the last second get behind him and punish with a forward smash of his own just you know an all or nothing gambit that didn't quite work for the side of fairfield and now they find themselves down 11 to nothing against a Maris team that just feels like the depth has really taken over this roster. Yeah, Maris is an enigma to me because they came out here saying how, oh, we're just playing to have fun. We're here. You know, if we win, we win. We lose, we lose. And they have been on a run, Soy. And they're not looking to slow down anytime soon. The ball just keeps rolling. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, through two weeks, to not only score 55 points is impressive, but to also keep the shutout, not drop a single game against anyone, is a, a fantastic statement too. Now, it's only been two weeks, and it is a long and grueling season, but the MAC conference is usually very uh, tightly contested. And so through two weeks in a conference that really uh, you know is pivotal, each win is so important, Maris is showing that, we're, well, even though they say they might be here to mess around, they're not here to mess around. Yeah, not at all. As we're getting into the next one now, I think that is Chimmy coming out there. I don't know who else plays Steve on Maris. And one of the... So, again, I think I had mentioned this earlier. Uh, Fairfield had mentioned they have three new Joker players, and T-Nulls is going to be the first one of them. But Chimmy, you've got to remember the punishes. You've got to put the respect on this Steve's name. 60% out the gate. That's almost an Arsene. Oh, there's Big Bro now. That was oh. huge. Oh, well, I guess Arsene not going to make an appearance quite yet. Not, not enough on that meter. There he is. <laughs> Chimmy's Steve is a work of art right here. The movement, mixing up your landing options and the punishes when you get hit, baiting an option and locking you in a hit lag because you dash attack the block instead of Steve. It's so hard to keep track of this character. It's like fighting a Looney Tune. It really is. And Chimmy does such a good job of you know, finding all those setups, and he's gonna get the punish there on the forward smash, so t -Null's already down one. Ooh, now being carried across the stage again. Kind of a bit earlier, Arsene, but doesn't really matter when you can't get the hit to begin with, as that's a nice Tetracon giving you some stage control. Jumping out of the minecart is gonna save Jimmy from eating any of that damage. Jumping all around. Going back on the stage, though, is going to be your downfall. Straight into the kill confirm on the platform. Now Tino's has a stop. Ooh, but that that combo, I mean Jimmy's he's got the bread and butter down right now, and Tino's is really falling victim to it as he's at 121. No Arsen probably online for this stock, barring well a lot. But Absolutely. it's not the bread and butter. This is the whole sandwich right here. Yeah. It does feel like Jimmy has all of the tricks up his sleeve and it's constant aggression right here as they're going all the way down, trying to crash their party with the minecart as you carry them up again, all the way up to the top, but they're not quite able to finish it. There is a block limit in Smash. Yeah, uh, and it feels like Chimmy right now. I mean, Tino's has our sense, so this is not out of the woods quite yet. If Chimmy holds on to this stock, though, well, 
instant karma, I guess. <laughs> yeah, Tino's, we do gotta give credit. I mean, Chimmy, maybe a little more stylish, but Tino's has been finding the ways through the maze again and again and again. But now you're sent off stage, thanks to the down smash. Tries to get off stage, but right there and then you're gonna get caught by the pickaxe. That's straight off stage. And Chimmy does get another one point on the board for Marist. Yeah, and Chimmy, I mean, you can tell he looks so dangerous. It's like you said, the fact that he has those combos pat down, right? Just fully 70% off of the start. And it feels like he can set it up from just about anywhere, right? So it just makes it so much more difficult when, you know, you have that that stuff down. And Tino's... Even though you found a way to get two kills, it felt like Chimmy was really in control of that match from start to finish. Yeah, and you know, in Minecraft PvP, it used to be the meta to have fishing rod always in your right hand. Well, that's exactly what Chimmy's doing because they are fishing constantly. It's all the time. And that I think is Chimmy's weakness. They've got this amazing combo game and they want to use it. They are rushing in nonstop. And one of Steve's the greatest strengths is to be able to control the momentum of the game. And while I do not mind Chimmy constantly rushing in, it is what leads to a lot of those trades. And then one misread at a high percent, you're down a stock. Yeah, and uh, and that's really what Tinoz was able to uh, take advantage of, right? Because he was able to find those two kind of mistakes from Chimmy. And I, I think the other part of it too is uh, when you have... Uh, sorry, because Arsene ha is on that meter, I feel like Tinol's. We didn't really see Rebels Guard a lot, but I feel like that's why Chimmy kind of threw out more grabs. He's like, okay, if the kill power is going to come from Arsene, let me just throw out that grab that's going to beat the Rebels Guard and see what I can get off of it. But Tinol's really didn't use Rebels Guard all that much. Yeah, certainly didn't, and they didn't really need to because they were just getting Arsene off of combos. Combos alone. So we'll see if they're able to clean it up now as they don't have to deal with a lot more of the extensions, but Steve brings his own platforms. Ooh, 60% instantly, the Chimmy Classic, and they're able to carry them across the stage with that soft spike, but not quite enough to kill yet. 95 on the board though, one misread and you're dead. Oh, the and patience yeah. though right there. Yeah, that was spooky and... I mean, if you're Tinol's, yeah, there goes your stock off the off the one combo, the up smash, cleaning it up. 16%. I think he only hit him once that stock. And it, if you're Tinol's, I mean, what do you do when you just constantly are being hit like this? It takes away so much of your momentum and so much of your game plan. Yeah, that, again, 63%. Chimmy has got that one. It's... It's like Smash 4 Mario, you start out at such a deficit, and now you're going to just barely be able to get back to stage, but that spike didn't die in either, and so they're going to be sent off stage. I love just putting the block there. I don't think that even blocks our send recovery, but it's just cheeky. I think he even lost our send too. He was too far away to grapple back to stage, so Jimmy, huge start here, and working on another one. If you can get this combo, there's the grab and not gonna hit the Rebels Guard either. Tries to hit the up tilt, but not quite out of that ma main true combo range. But hey, they got the high percent combos too. Waiting out the counter as well, Chimmy. That's the second time they've done that in a row. Such a read on when Tinoz is panicking, when they want to throw out that counter, and now they're off stage. They've got the tether recovery, so a little bit safe from sound, but those blocks trip them up a little bit. That forwarder, that was huge. Just the tip of it gonna be able to connect and get that kill. So stock number one off the board for Chimmy, but still Tinoz with so much work to do and he's at such a high percentage. Oh, right there. I, I like the idea. You know they love that uh that up smash to try and armor through it, but now Etricarn is really the only mileage that Tinoz is getting and oof. Trying to go for the cross up right there, puts you right in the forward smash range. Jimmy's not going to let you get away with that. Another two points and make it two more. Double or nothing for Marist right now as they would need a perfect game right now to win this. And I don't think Marist is going to give it to him. <laughs> yeah, not the way that uh, Marist, not the way that Marist has played the past two weeks. Two, two perfect games would tie it up and set it to overtime. But 
I mean, we've talked about the depth of this roster and the experience that's on it, and they haven't even gotten to most of the experience yet. Rograt was really the one of the veterans of this roster, and he's he was in on the second set. I think we still have to see players like Zucchini and Luke who might come in against the Stags here. So, I mean. What can you say? Chimmy was just all over that matchup, and it feels like Maris is really on top of things. I love that Steve's in this game, Soy. I, the interactions that we were seeing there, honestly, one of my favorite things to watch from the Steve was the landings. Uh, going for a lot of B-reverse block placements as they're falling down uh, to just sort of mix up the timing. And then also, like, I don't know those of you out there in the audience if you've ever played steve for the first time it feels so awkward to build but when you're able to actually master the exact jump heights that you need to place the blocks where you want them it's an art form flying through the sky like that yeah i mean it's like you said when you can when you have the ability to fully extend those combos and get that 60 plus percent like just imagine starting your match having already been hit by a Ridley skewer. That's what that combo feels like. It just, it's like a sucker punch. It just, it takes the wind out of your sails. And what do you do there if you're T-Nulls? You're, you're starting off at a deficit. Every single stock is what it feels like. And if there are any players out there, uh, any teams out there watching this for data, I have one recommendation for you. If you have anyone who defines their play style as slow, patient, and defensive, maybe watches a lot of the Buzz videos, you should definitely put them up against Chimmy. Because the thing is, again, did you see how Chimmy started every single game? Up tilt. Just walking towards you with up tilt. Mm -hmm. And if they hit that up tilt, it's the 60%. But it's not an especially good approach option. Um, so if you're able to find just someone who can show Chimmy that their game, pl game plan isn't going to work, force them to adapt on the fly. I think they're going to have a really good chance against that, Steve. But for now, Chimmy going to take the W as Maris extends their amazing lead. Yeah, and we saw, you know, it, it wasn't perfect gameplay from Chimmy because Tinoz was able to find some openings and take some stocks off the board. But like we said, when it's, you know, Constant, when you're constantly at a deficit like that because you're falling into that up tilt, you're falling prey to all of the setups, then yeah, it's it's going to be difficult to find yourself back in the match. So game number four here between these two, this looks like Zucchini coming in on the side of the Maris Red Foxes. Yeah, certainly does. Um, maybe didn't quite get the correct stage. Yeah, I'm like... <laughs> that would be a next... Zucchini has always been a little bit of a uh, cheeky well, player, but try. that would be a next level of BM to be like, I'm going to fight you with one stock. <laughs> and it looks like he'll be going up against Heath. And Heath is another one of those newer players for Fairfield who will also be uh, using Joker, it looks like. And Heath, for, his new, for how new he is to the EGF, I think he's actually been... Uh, pretty fun to watch. I believe week one he got a victory against, I believe it was St. Peter's, and uh, last week they struggled a little bit more, but you know, you can see, again, the, the flashes of brilliance are there. It's just a matter of, can he put it all together on the same week? Yeah, well, that's what's being put up against, up for the test against Zucchini himself. Now, you talked about get, starting out the match getting hit by a Ridley Skewer. That is not out of the question right now based on how Zucchini plays, but I'm thinking I'm going to go for a little more of this bread and butter until they just get stuffed out like that. I like this. Stuffing out their approach options with the gun, but all Zucchini needs is that one hit. But even when they get the hit, they're interrupted. Yeah, and Keith looking for that drag down up air, but can't quite land the last bit of it, and Zucchini doing a really good job of spacing right now. Sent off the edge as well. Ooh, I love that, but they didn't quite get the fastball in there in time to actually contest that recovery. Now you're actually able to get Zucchini off the edge, though, and I don't think Zucchini was ready for this level of patient play. Yeah. I mean, Tino's get... Or, sorry, uh, Keith gets a little bit greedy, and he's going to get side beat for it there. Losing his first stock, but I like the fact that Heath was willing to go out for the edge guard. It just feels like he's kind of tunnel visually visioning, excuse me, on these edge guards. Oh, and I love using the multiple jumps there to just weather the storm of that hail of bullets. 
is now Zucchini, playing underneath this platform really well. This is how you control stage on Pokemon Stadium 2. And Heath now has Arsene on the board, but Zucchini, again, with all the stage control, just not making it easy for Heath to make good use of it. Ooh. Going for a lot of pummels right there is actually going to get you punished a little bit, but Zucchini, the weight, the patience, as you're still going to get back to stage, just the stare down off stage. That was, that was beautiful, too. And, and it was instant recognition. The second that Rebel's Guard was used offstage, he just goes, okay, I'm going to wait this out. Three, two, one, back air, and he cleans up the stock. Zucchini, I'm sorry for saying you weren't ready. Um, because maybe a low percent Ridley getting juggled around a little bit, but Zucchini, their lease on life has been extended long past his warranty date. Is now... I get the forward throw. Pretty much anything will kill from Zucchini right now with max rage, but the forward smash will take away that range. Yeah, that was huge for Heath, just to get a little bit of momentum on the board and take that first stock. And Ridley is susceptible to a lot of Joker's combos, but side B coming in clutch once again, not going to be able to take the stock quite yet. Right here, right now. Going to whiff that side B. An opportunity right here to at least make sure you're not dropping too many points or maybe take the stock if you're able to get the correct read right here. I love that double jump forward air. The low percents for Heath have been so good, but now you're getting to the part where you struggled before, the high percents. How are you going to find this kill? Rolling back, giving Zucchini the respect they need because any hit will kill. Sent off stage. Able to get part of the counter, but at that angle, you're not going to get much mileage off of it, and the back air on shield is not safe with that spacing. Back there, not going to kill quite yet, though. That was huge, and he's still surviving here, but I feel like Heath's game plan right now is to just kind of chip away at this damage, and it's only going to work for so long because Zucchini's character just has so much raw kill power. Yeah, that is going to do it. Straight off the top right there, Heath. Kind of heartbreaking, to be honest, of how they open it up, and then Zucchini just activates Ultra Instinct at high percents, and you can't quite find the way in repeatedly. Yeah, uh, and I feel like, again, I think Heath just kind of tunnel visioned on a couple of uh, opportunities. Like, I love the fact that he was willing to go out for some of those edge guards, but especially late when he's trying to make that comeback, he get he gets the double jump forward air uh, to knock Zucchini off stage, and then he goes for two side Bs in practically the same spot. And I understand that you want the, the damage that side B provides, but... It doesn't really do anything. If you go out there once more, you kind of threaten that presence a little bit more. You can cover more options. And it just kind of felt like he was so focused on not dying that he wasn't able to secure stocks. Yeah, I do feel like that is a weakness when it comes to defense at times. You've got to know when to go in. Maybe not so much as some other players we have seen. Uh, maybe not like Chimmy, but... Yeah, it, and it really did feel like their advantage state was so strong. Did you see the edge guards they would get on Zucchini? Zucchini tried to go high, middle, low, middle, low, every single option, and it kept getting covered. They kept Zucchini off stage for like 75% during one of the stocks. But it wasn't yeah. enough, because they weren't quite able to find the kills, it's just the little tippy tucks. But, yeah. No, absolutely. And, and Zucchini, I mean... You talked about a great uh, ability to survive. Joker is a character that feels like he should be able to clean up stocks, especially when you're sitting at above 150. It feels like any character should be able to clean up stocks against Ridley. But again, surviving to what I think 170, 180 was what we saw before he finally lost his stock. So Zucchini, great job of you know playing for your stock. Three, two, one, now, been put on the battlefield. I do like this as, oh, respect, or is it mind games? It was respect. Um, <laughs> as Zucchini's, this is online communication if I've ever seen it. As finally we get into it, the mating dance is over. Now it's time for the brawl. 
is I, that's actually a nice rebels card. I honestly thought that we were gonna have another like stage mix up and they were about to run off stage again, but yeah, I like the, I like the respect shown before the match. Zucchini going for a read there on the roll, but doesn't find the forward smash. Yeah, and now is he's Zucchini. Oh, fishing with that down tilt, and they get a bite. And that Uffy immediately covering the entire platform right there. It might have been punishable hypothetically, but with the angle that Heath was going for, not quite. I love this though. Zucchini always just drifting underneath the stage and carrying them all the way across, slamming your face on the ground. Over the stock for Zucchini and oh, they went for the skewer. They went for it. That's twice now I think Zucchini's gone for the skewer. Once was off of that grab, uh, as you just saw, but neither have landed and that's going to be the classic down air to up smash and Heath is on the board. Yeah, as Heath playing a little cleaner than before, just one good opening right here. But the tech away is actually going to keep them safe for now. Some still very good options right here as they get the tech chase, not quite. Go for the read on the neutral get up, but that's not going to be it. But really safe pressure, to be honest. I mean, Joker's moves don't exactly space themselves, but Heathcliff does. As they're able to just go all the way down and get some chip damage for their trouble, as they're not even looking to contest with any burst options that Zucchini might be throwing off at that ledge. I mean, between the side B and the up B taking so many stocks, but that was so smart from Zucchini. The second again, you recognize, hey, they've gone for the Rebels Guard, even though the hits are landing. If I just space this forward, uh, forward tilt properly. Ooh, oh, oh, going for a ride. Teeth and Zucchini cleans up the stock. That was the triple dump special right there. Ford air into Ford air into Ford Air. As a former <laughs> Jigglypuff player, I'm very familiar with that true combo. But either way, when you have the idea that your opponent is going to instantly jump as soon as you're off stage and you can catch it with another Ford Air, it's game over. Especially when you've got the jumps to actually follow them all the way out of there. The thing is, Zucchini could have lived that, but even if they couldn't have, when you're up a stock like that and you have that guaranteed kill, you've got to take it. Yeah. A absolutely and uh, i mean again just the the ability to go off an edge guard and just not give your opponent that chance to make the comeback that's really something that a lot of these teams i think have kind of worked on in the off season and zucchini showing it in spades here yes yeah, certainly as 22 and 0 marist obviously won this but there is a point of honor and i will bring it up in the post match interview if they get it Fairfield has the chance to end the streak right here and now with an amazing performance from what looks like it's going to be IV is our next player. And they're up against Perfect Effect, Ef Perfect Effect X. That is going to be a tough one. Another one of the heavy hitters, but still very doable. Fairfield has been keeping it close in a many of these games, but never able to close it out. And IV is one of these experienced players for the side of Fairfield. Uh, typically goes Falco from what I remember uh, from last season. So we'll have to see how he does here. And again, the perfect streak on the line once more here in set number five. You've got to love these win streaks. And I mean, against the Captain Falcon, this is pretty doable. I mean... Captain Falcon does struggle a little bit with a lot of Falco's tools, and Falco does have the ability to go off stage a lot more than other characters. We'll see how they're able to use that ability to their advantage, though, as the side view will get you to center stage, but you're just getting traded with all these hitboxes, and you're getting a percent at most. Yeah, and you can tell Ivy is really struggling here. I think most of his damage has really come from those lasers. That's not a safe getup from ledge, and he really wants that knee so badly as trying to catch the tech chase right there maybe get a jab lock instead not sure if that does that but either way now you're able to get captain falcon off stage but at that angle there's no opportunity to really get an edge card you've got to just ledge trap as just trying to get the guaranteed damage converting onto the platform but that's not going to set up a tech situation yet i like that 
I like that initial mix-up. It feels like, you know, Falco would typically go for something like up air, but the follow-up into that down air was was good. But like you said, didn't really lead in any, anything afterward. And that jab on shield, not going to be quite safe. But Perfect Effect X, a gentleman about it, is going to let you land scot-free. And now that is going to get you some mileage. Falco off stage, but... I'm not quite able to catch that side B whatsoever. Good spacing by Ivy, but you're still gonna lose the stock now. Perfect effect X. Yeah. Are we trading one for one? But Ivy keeping this very close. I'm actually kind of shocked that that up air killed, but I believe that's really his first up air to land. So good job of tying things back up. But like you said, perfect effects uh, X has been really good so far at keeping Ivy to the corner. And for a character with a, quote, res very exploitable recovery, IV did an amazing job living forever right here, but against this, ooh, that was run read away from a knee. But they're just able to harass with that laser a little bit, get back to the ledge, as they go for the landing, but they're caught by the nair. Now, IV playing the center stage. They keep going for these kind of unsafe options, but they're doing it in a way that Perfect Effect X hasn't found the perfect way to punish them yet. Did you see the spacing around that laser? He avoided the very last hitbox of that laser, and he's gonna be able to clean up the stock here for it too. After avoiding the laser, got the down tilt, continued the edge guard, and now up a stock and practically a full one too. Yeah, looking very clean right now. Just go for the landing there. The up tilt doesn't really lead into anything much though, but there's the spike, 83% on Perfect Effect X. If you're able to get the finisher right here, you can very easily even this up with one combo. But the down throw, good DI out to avoid the nair, but that time not so lucky. Maybe holding in just a little bit since you're at ledge. Back air, can you get the finisher? No. Well, now the situations are switched here because IV on the ledge. How do you make it back here? That's nearly the spike the opposite direction i sometimes forget that that side beat for falco spikes but that's the clean up tilt to back air to tie things up in terms of stocks and right now that's a down throw right there Ooh, perfect di to avoid that knee though really really good as now ivy maybe floundering a little bit as you're trying to find this opening i've seen six side b's in the last 30 seconds as they just want to land they want to land so badly but perfect effect x will not let them another side b and it's getting caught on to it's only a matter of time before the read comes out but maybe there was enough time for ivy to find their opening there it is send them off stage perfect effect x this spiked and they're dead ivy puts a point on the board take that maris <laughs> I, I'm actually shocked he got the spike hitbox. It's so it's so satisfying to hear, but fantastic stuff to IV to bring that back. I mean, again, he was down a stock, down 50%, and found a way to get the job done, and the stags are on the board. Yeah, 1 to 22. As we have said, they're in the unwinnable range. It's game over. But you have won something far more valuable. The honor to say that, hey, maybe we are your rivals because we were the first people to take a game from you. And Perfect Effect X is not exactly an easy target. It's not like they're one of the freshman Waltzen in here who's just getting sent out to play. Yeah, no, absolutely. And he was in control of that match for through the first half of it, it felt like. He takes that first stock. I mean, he loses it almost immediately after, but... The fact that he kind of had that edge in the first place really put the pressure on IV. And so IV finding that down air was really clutch of him. Yeah, that was a very nice jump read. And not without merit. We'd seen uh, Perfect Effect X going for a rather high recovery time and time again. In general, just aggressive options. But now, this is a stage where Falcon Speed gives him a room to play. Doesn't matter that your dash dance takes eight years if you, you know, can do it across the stage and then run into burst. Yeah, and uh, you also have the walls of Kalos to help your recovery a little bit too, making recovering lower uh, a little bit more helpful. Now, I, Falco also gets that benefit, but we'll have to see what the edge guards look like from here on out as right now, Perfect that Effect X is all over IV once again. They wanted that so bad, but they're going to avoid the up tilt right there. Perfect effect X. Going to keep them at ledge. Hard read, though, on the jump. That's going to be punished just with a laser. 
is Ivy, this is kind of a repeat of what we saw last time. A very strong start from Perfect Effect X, but they weren't able to get the clean th finisher to their combo, and now Ivy has their turn to play. And typically, you would think it's the other way around, where Falco might, you know, have these characters fall out of his kill percents early, but Perfect Effect X done a good job. There he is cleaning up that stock with the down tilt. I believe that's the second one he's been able to, to catch throughout this set. Oh, and the jab extension right there, looking for the drop zone dare, but it's not going to come out. But they still are able to reset the free situation with a grab. Sends them back off stage. No time to go for a very aggressive option right there. So just for the down tilt again. Stay safe, stay sanitary. As perfect effect X. Not looking to give up this stock quite as easily. And these down throws, again, they're getting an idea of where IV likes to DI off of them. And once Falcon knows how you're holding, it's a scary sight indeed. I mean, how many times has he been, has he been that close to finding the stomp or the knee, right? He's starting to get a read on where IV wants to go after these throws. So has to play so carefully. Perfect Effect X has done a really good job, too, of surviving here at 130. The Nair. Oh, that is going to be a rough one. But the up he had a shield. Good option right there. Actually, Falcon's fastest option out of shield. And to set up the ledge trap, but either way, just annoyance with these lasers is enough to sort of uh, ice you out. But now, it is actually IV who has stage control for the moment, keeping Perfect Effect X on that platform with a good drift away right there. You see that little wiggle in the air to make it unclear where they were landing? They're getting playful. Yeah, that was huge, too, because you could tell IV's like, yes, this is my opening, goes in, and he actually ends up dashing past him and missing on the down tilt. So that upbeat, yeah, that's going to kill, too. That's huge. That's two stocks off the board for IV. Yeah, Perfect Effect X in danger of uh well only getting the one point on the board but i mean this game might be a throwaway sometimes you've got to call it but it's still feasible that you're able to it it, it you got to just use this as practice you've got to use this as data gathering how are you going to find the kill that's what you're going to try and figure out here bring it into the next game the final game and see what you can do with it I mean, at 178, you gotta figure that he's working on borrowed time, but maybe not as Perfect Effect X. Well, he will fall there, lost track of his jumps, and so unable to recover. So stock number one off the board, and IV now, he's gonna be very careful at 99%. Ooh, and the Uppia Shield at ledge, I thought you were a goner, but I'd be gonna be living for now. Just poking with that down tilt, trying to get an opening right there, but the spacing on that side B wasn't quite enough to lead into a combo. It feels like IV has started to go for a few more grabs, but he just has not connected on her. Oh, I love running your head straight into the side to avoid it right there, but if the first side B up B at ledge didn't kill, that one definitely will. IV sent off the side. Some more points on the board for Maris, but they don't really matter. Because now we're going into the final game. Can you prevent dropping a set? That is the key right here. Fairfield definitely has the tools to get some more points on the board. The question is, can they? Yeah, and I think maybe that game one just gave Ivy a little too much confidence because Perfect Effects X really came out in that game too swinging. I mean, right from the bat, you saw he was off to an early lead and then... I mean, stock number two, it just felt like he was chipping away time and time again, and IV really could not find an opening. Even the stock that Perfect Effect X lost, it felt like he overextended more than IV got the stock off of him. Yeah, it definitely was. Sometimes you get caught up in the ecstasy of combos. It's easy to lose yourself. And... Landing up airs is Falcon. Ladder combos in general, you just want to keep going. You just want to keep climbing. And even though some characters can, hey, Jimmy, um, it, y when you're going off stage like that, especially to try and drift out and get the finisher with a knee, it's really easy to get overzealous. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And uh, as we get ready for game number three between these two, I mean, I can't imagine a character switch, but it certainly is not out of the question. Nope, they're running it back one more time.
So let's see if the perfect set count can stay for the Red Foxes. Three, two, yeah, moving one, the goalposts a little go. bit, but hey, you gotta keep the narrative up somehow. As, again, poking. That is the how they start out, but a bit of a different start. Usually it's Perfect Effects X who gets the massive lead in the opening. Instead, it's IV who got the up tilt, and they are not dropping this. The Nair right there, not overextending, and I love using the platform right there to delay your dare just a little bit. Resetting on the platform, but falling through with the up air is just barely going to miss the Tekken place. I really love the pressure from IV right now, and he's threatening the offstage movement as well. Perfect Effect X has really dipped low the last two times, but possibly the follow-up off that grab? Nope, I'm just gonna hold back, and now here's the chance for uh, Effect X to strike back. Perfect Effect X. Is going to be caught by the up tilt back air. That is something we haven't seen too often, but at ledge, that's pretty much guaranteed right there to be your downfall. IV with the creep, pretty good stock lead, but right there, oh, good DI down to avoid the knee there. Yeah, that was really good. And IV at 85 is at kill percent of a strong hit from Perfect Effects hits, but again, he's done such a good job of avoiding those strong hits, avoiding those knees. And so far at 92%, if he can hold on to the stock, that's a lot of momentum for him. Yeah, Ivy can definitely close this out. Is again, a very aggressive side B. From Perfect Effect X hasn't been catching on to them, so if they haven't, then you might as well keep using that movement option until it gets hard called out. Oh, speaking yeah, those, of hard called out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those those side B's getting a little ambitious, and that up B out of shield once more coming into play for Perfect Effect X. Yeah. Pressuring the shield with the up tilts that high up. Ooh, that was almost a kill right there. Not quite able to do it, but running forward with the down tilt, the split to take away Perfect Effect X's stock. Taking off stage on the Nair train, though. But with only a stock, you can't overextend like you did before. IV really controlling the tempo of this game in a way they just couldn't on Kalos. You saw Perfect Effect X go for the immediate equalizer on that stomp, but he doesn't quite get the spike hitbox, and now this is going to allow for a chance for IV to get some extra credit. Those side Bs, again, a little ambitious, but Perfect Effect X has not been able to punish them so far this set. Forward air catching the run in. Perfect Effect X, the freight train, maybe need to pull on the brakes a little bit as they try and slow down, do some nares in place, make IV get a little antsy. But either way, they miss the tech in. Only one hit of that up tilt connects, though, not enough to follow up into that dare IV tried. The laser interrupting Perfect Effect X's edge guard there, and IV still a full stock up. And that back air nearly going to do it. Perfect Effect X in a lot of trouble here. Good job avoiding that back air. Yeah, they wanted that dare so, or back air so bad, but not going to be awarded it. The up tilt out of shield again. The down tilt not quite going to kill. Going all the way up to try and get the finisher. Perfect Effect X has to be wary. How are they going to get the punish right there? Try to run forward with the up B, but that is going to be your doom. It's a fast option, yeah, but... Grab the hug isn't quite as big as you think it is. Gonna be taking out, and well, if I'm counting correctly, that's five points on the board. Yeah, Fairfield University, a respectable showing right here against Maris, who frankly have looked unstoppable. And if IV is that veteran player who has been coaching all these new players on Fairfield, I think we're gonna be seeing some better stuff coming out in future weeks from Fairfield. I mean, you got to remember Fairfield last year was one of these teams that really struggled last season. They were towards the back end of that MAC conference. And so to start this season at one and one, uh, although you fall here to Marist to fall to that record of one and two, it's about kind of separating yourself from the pack. And the way Marist has looked this season to shut them down, to get points on them, to show that they're not invincible is a really big start for this Fairfield roster. Yeah. Overall, I feel like Maris is one of the more unique teams we see just in the pure variety of what they've got to show for. Even the freshmen are just dark horses. Uh, it, it reminds me of, first of all, I think Chimmy is a freshman. Um, that's kind of wild. But beyond <laughs> just that, 
we also have players. I've got to shout out the homie Stinky Cheese Seven Eight Two. Gonna be thriving off of these new buffs coming to their character, but they come out here and they get three stocks too on lesser teams. So I, I don't know. Maris does have a lot of answers. I do think that they are very strong contender for winning, uh, winning the MAC this year, just based on consistency throughout the roster alone. Yeah, it, it really is a, a, a highly uh, compact roster. It feels like they've got answers for a lot of things. And what's interesting too is that when we talk about championship caliber teams, a lot of the uh, teams have that variety in them, right? They, you've got characters that can play that type of zoning game. You've got characters that can be rushdown style, or you've got those characters that can kind of adapt to both. And I feel like that's what makes Maris so fun to watch is that a lot of their players are very adaptive mid set rather than controlling the pace. They can adapt to whatever pace is thrown at them. And as you can tell, it's worked to their success so far. And we can ask them a little bit more about what metronome they're using to keep that pace. In just a couple minutes as we're going to go to a quick break when we return. We're going to have an interview with a representative from Marist College. So we'll see you all then.
Welcome back, everybody, to EGFC. We're right after our first match of the day where Marist College took it in dominant fashion once again. And we are here with Rograt, who we saw tear it up earlier. How are you doing it, Rograt? I'm great. How are you? Okay. I'm doing fantastic. And I assume you all have to, as well as Marist College has come out the gate swinging. Like, you haven't dropped, well, up until now, anyways. You had not dropped a single game, a single set, but your streak has been broken. I hate to start it on a low note, but how's that feel? <laughs> uh, we're not too worried about that at all. Um, you know, the, that doesn't really matter. It's, what all really matters is uh, the win column, and we're 3-0 right now. We're, we're looking good, and uh, you know, I'm proud of my team. Yeah, that's the mentality you need. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, so you uh, were in the second set. You were going up against Jerry, who was one of the heavy hitters on this Fairfield roster. Uh, what was kind of going through your mind as you got into that set? Uh, well, so game one, he played Terry, and I'm pretty comfortable with the Terry matchup. Um, we had a, a Terry player here last year who I played a lot. Um, but game two, he went Kazuya, and Kazuya, I've never played a Kazuya before. <laughs> um, that was my first time ever playing Kazuya. So um, I didn't really know what he had, but um, you know, I just played my game, and uh, I think I handled it pretty well. I mean, yeah, hey, if you uh, if you don't know what game they're going to play, then don't let them play at all. It's exactly. Admirable strategy. But either way, that kind of was the, the option select, I guess. I did want to ask about uh, your match as well. I had noticed you really like to go for these, like, really heavy-hitting strings but then you just always love the drag downs like how like what is in your like mind as you're going for these like all of a sudden cutting your combo short for the drag down into the finish like that seems to be your signature <laughs> yeah i well with the drag down i don't really think that that's cutting the combo short i think that that's a it's a unconventional way of extending it and um, setting up into something stronger. So, you know, if I can get the drag down and they miss the tech, or I can get a dash attack out of their tech roll, then, it, you know, the combo just gets longer. And, um, you know, I think that's the way that you have to play Greninja and you have to extend his combos. Because his combos are kind of limited, so being able to extend them with that is uh, pretty big. Okay. Imagination right there. Good for you. <laughs> I, was, I was actually gonna ask, uh, I don't know how long you've played the game for, but how how did you end up settling on a character like Greninja? Um, I I started playing pretty much my freshman year here, uh, which was three years ago. Um, and I looked for a character for a pretty long time, and I just came across Greninja because uh, you know I like Pokemon, and Greninja's fast. He's got a lot of cool combos, and that's what I like in a character. Um, I played melee before Ultimate, so ah. um, having a, a fast combo heavy character was uh, comfortable for me. And then uh, you know, it just kind of clicked. I practiced him up, and um, now I'm I'm here. He's uh he's he's been tearing it up lately. <laughs> yeah, you're Absolutely. definitely showing that. And I actually did want to ask one last question before we head out. You've got a lot of heavy hitters on your team from bottom to the top. So I've got to ask, who do you think is probably the most underrated player who's actually like really sick on your team? I, I know you can say all of them, but who in particular do you want to shout out as secretly being really sick and they haven't really gotten to show it yet? Uh, I mean, you know what? At this point, um, we've seen most of our players. We've got like 10 players that I think could realistically start on most teams. But if I had to pick one underrated player, it would have to be Stinky Cheese. Uh, his Jigglypuff is a menace. Jigglypuff just got buffed and he's been labbing out all the new Jigglypuff stuff like He's a he's a force to be reckoned with, uh, so that <laughs> that's definitely my pick. Hey, okay. let's go, Stinky Cheese seven eight two. I think I got that right. But either way, thank you very much for doing this interview right now. Uh, honestly, I wish you best of luck. You're looking like a very strong contender for the Mac. Yeah, thank you for having me. Of course, of course. And with that, we're gonna cut off the first game of week three. But don't go anywhere. We are going to be back soon with another game in just a little bit. But for now, I've been Keel Miles, casting with Soy. We will see you when the second game starts.